Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today for our uh, sprint demo uh, that occurs every four weeks. Uh, so we have quite a lot of content uh, to cover today. So it's also quite technical. Um, so I'm going to try to focus to try to make it a little bit less technical to focus on how the feature looks for users and then kind of go from there and then go backwards to go, OK, how do you get to that point? Um, so we'll start with a few of the easier features to kind of go through. Um, so first of all, we've finally um, done the consolidation of the thin edge services. Uh, so this basically means that the functionality of the Tedge configuration plugin and the Tedge log plugin are now all rolled up in the Tedge agent. So how does that look now? So if I just choose one of my devices, I look at the services tab now, you'll see the app, or you won't see the Tedge log plugin and the Tedge configuration plugin. But you can still see here that I can still request for all the configurations on the device that I can, it still behaves like it did before. And the same with the logs. So I can get all that information uh, if I by configuration. Sets, reset. So I'm just setting some default configuration so it has some sensible things. So in the log, I then have some actions here to see the different log files. So all the functionality is there, um, but it's using less services. So this means that it's actually easier to manage. So if you need to restart the Tedge agent for all of your device management functionality, uh, then you only need to restart one service. And it's a little bit easier to manage and it's easier for us to expand in the future. And it actually means a lower um, memory footprint because you're not having the same services, which they had a lot of like the same kind of runtime uh, set up. You can really just focus on running all of the features that most of the people wanted anyway out of the box. Um, and it's just more convenient to run. This will also have a big impact on our containerization story because it makes running a single process container super easy because the Tedge agent includes everything, like everything from the non mapping kind of functionality. So all of like the device management functionality. Then the other notable uh, feature is that we have the ability now to use HTTP endpoints or HTTPS endpoints uh, for both the Comlocity proxy and the file transfer service. So, but just be aware, this is at the moment, we've just enabled that functionality. So if you're a power user and know how to generate client certificates and server-side certificates and everything, then you can configure that to your liking. However, if you're not familiar with that, then you'll probably have a very difficult time. Um, so we're looking at making the usability aspect later uh, or next year, looking to address that by, for instance, maybe a local PKI um, to make the configuration of all these kind of certificate things locally in the network a lot easier. But it was important for the, the 1.0 release that we really enable people to use HTTPS if they're capable of doing so. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, so it's a um, a kind of we're looking to improve the documentation regarding that and basically remove the complexity of the user configuration. OK, then to the main event. Um, so we want to showcase today the firmware management. Uh, feature of thin edge. So this has been a long requested feature. Um, so we now have a, a, a working demo that we can kind of show. But I think before we kind of like get into showing all of it, uh, I wanted to cover a few kind of basics because firmware management can it means different things to different people. So in the thin edge concept, we don't try to dictate what firmware means. So it could either mean an operating system update. It could mean actually flashing something on a modem chip. We don't know. Um, so we made a generic workflow concept 
where we can do different states and whatever your definition of that means, um, you work through the different states to then apply a new binary which contains your firmware and then does some actions and then says, yes, I'm good, I've applied, or no, I haven't, something's gone wrong. So, however, for the most cases, what is commonly kind of requested that firmware management actually means operating system updates. So to demonstrate how you can use the thin edge workflow concept to do AB updates, so operating system using two petitions, A and B, um, we have two examples, one running the Mender standalone. So that's the open source variant, not Mender.io, the open source variant. Um, which is just a single binary, and also uh, RugPy, which is kind of a, a newer um, uh, AB kind of update mechanism, uh, and the creator is actually in the call, so hi, Maxi. Um, so we have a, a way, or like we have a demonstration building an image with RugPy, because that also has a few niceties with using a more modern build system, and you can kind of automate it on GitHub Actions very, very easily. Um, but with all of the solutions, also with the workflow concepts that we bring in within Edge, it can be extended to other kind of tooling like SW Update or IUAC um, to do if you're already using that, but then you need to create your own workflow to do this. So it's quite easy um, to do. So I'm hoping that with our two demonstrations of the Mender and RugPy, that it's quite easy to extend if you have other kind of requirements. But first of all, I wanted to go through the common concepts with what AB updates actually mean. So regardless of the solution, like Mender, RugPy, SW Update, um, I'm not sure about the RUAC, um, but I'm quite sure, is when you're doing a reliable OS update, the reliability is critical. And so that usually means to make it reliable, you actually have to have two petitions. So one is like your hot petition and one is your cold. So the hot one is your active one where your operating system is running or like your device is currently running the software on it. When you're doing an update, you will then write to the non-active petition. So if you're, let's say the active petition is A, you wanna deploy a new Debian um, base image you write to the B petition, then you tell to the bootloader, which is coordinating, which is the, the hot petition, you say, hey, can you please boot in B? B comes up, you do a validation check to say, yes, it worked, no, it didn't. Or in the case where it hasn't even booted, then the bootloader is smart enough to say, okay, you tried to boot in B, but it didn't fail, like it failed, because uh, it didn't even boot at all, which can happen. Um, then it'll automatically switch back to A. Or if you want to, you boot it into the B petition, but maybe Thin Edge wasn't running and you're going, okay, well, I want to reboot back into the other petition uh, if you know my critical services are not running. So this is common for all the solutions. To make this happen, at the very beginning, you need to flash an initial image on the device. This cannot be done via over-the-air updates. This is critical. This is common to any solution you look at. It's about the reliability because this mechanism needs the bootloader working, the two petitions there, maybe a persistent petition. There's a lot of prerequisites to this. So that's why you need to initially flash the device with a like a, a bootstrap image, I've been calling it. Um, then from that point onwards, you can then use over the air updates. But you need that initial image. And because you need this initial image, you need to build an image. Um, so this is actually what everyone, like every of the device manufacturers are already doing. But for users who are more like casual dev users, getting into the world of Yocto is very, very, very daunting because it is not a user-friendly tool. It's not for beginners whatsoever. Um, so, I just want to preface that because I've been using Yocto for the last month and have experienced some of these kind of uh, usability problems. Um, but the the main thing, the the benefit of Yocto, it is 
it has a high adoption rate from hardware manufacturers. It is actually the default build kit. There's like everyone has a, a Yocto layer uh, to build Yocto images. So it's actually quite composable and quite flexible. But the Yocto principle is you need to build everything yourself. Um, RugPy, probably if you're a casual and have no idea what Yocto is, use RugPy. I would recommend that because it's much more user friendly. You can build an image on CI. And then there's other options that you can use, like build root, for example. But again, I don't think we have an example of that for that. But if you're already using it, it's quite easy to adapt. OK, so with that kind of groundwork, I just want to kind of go into how it looks. So. Actually, before I do that, because there's a few things which take a long time to build or like relatively long, I'm just going to trigger a a build, so I don't know if you can see that. So for example, we have a, uh, a thin edge rug pie image, which builds this kind of like initial image, and it can be used for the bootstrapping, and it can be used for over the air updates. So it has a similar concept with Yocto, we have recipes and everything. Uh, so for example, um, I just have user packages recipe where I want to add a new package, um, I don't know. Let's make sure H top is then installed. So what I'm just going to do is do a quick feature to show uh, at H top, just to kind of show the workflow because this takes 15 minutes and I can show the online stuff at H top as default. to a user packages. So I'm just doing a PR request um, in the repository just so we can kind of see what the workflow is and going, yep, that looks fine. For those who are keen, HTOP is already installed, but this just confirms it's installed, um, but that's okay. That's merged. I know I'm going fast. Um, we can go into details in more in the community meetup that we have planned for next year that will go into kind of like the um, finer details of this, but it's more just a um, with the appetite. Okay, I'm just going to do a new release of the image by just tagging it, and then my CI CD will kick in now. Okay, so that can run in the background while I talk and show the actual features. Okay, so if I go back to, so I'm just using Comlocity for demonstration purposes, but again, we can apply the same thing uh, to uh, the other clouds. So it's just because I have a nice UI that I can actually present something. Uh, so for example, I've created two kind of groups. So I have all of my uh, RugPy devices. Um, so RugPy's, um, currently suited for Raspberry Pi devices, uh, hence the name. Uh, so at the moment, we actually oh, like it supported all of the, the versions of um, Raspberry Pi from 0, 1 to 5. Um, so I actually have a example of all of the Raspberry Pis. So they're all running here, as I can see in the firmware. They're all running kind of different variants because the different Raspberry Pis will have different base images. Um, so, for example, four and five share the same one, but if you have a Raspberry Pi Zero, which uses ARM HF, that needs a different image. And there's a few kind of difference, uh, differences between the different hardware versions. So, as you can see here I, in my fleet of devices, I can see what the, the current firmware version is, or like the firmware type, and the firmware version. So, let's look at one of these devices. Let's go to a Raspberry Pi 4. So instantly I can see that, so we have some included in the base image includes some like information about the operating system because it's quite helpful to reason with the device, what, what version of Debian is it running, um, what kernel version, et cetera. So I can read all that information from here. And we can see now we have a firmware tab. So I can see the current firmware version or the name and then the version. 
so I've just used in in the build system. I've used it kind of a date orientated thing um, just so we can kind of see and it's an auto automatically increasing um, version. So to be able to then do an update, all I have to do is replace firmware because firmware has this inherent trait that you don't really update the firmware, you replace it because you can't have two firmware running on the same kind of petition. So it's always a replacement of the whole thing. So you can, it's not like software where you can, you know, update software and it's kind of independent. You could have multiple versions of the software technically running. Um, so this is more of a, I'm replacing like the base core image. Um, so the baseline and then the software is kind of included on top. Um, so here we can see that for this image, I, I'm presented with different options. So I can see this is an image that I built yesterday. So I'm just going to update to the latest image and go install. And so in the workflow, because to make it kind of easier, hey, what's happening? Because this can actually be quite a long process. In my example workflow that I created for the, the rug pie, we actually include some events just to give it a little bit more richer interface, because if something goes wrong, I kind of need to know or I would like to receive in real time, what state is it in? So is it downloading the image? Is it installing the image? Has it switched to the petition? What petition is it currently on? And all these kind of very complicated things. I wanted to get a bit of like uh, real time insight into it. So if we look at the timestamps, let me make that a bit bigger. We can see that it started just now and we've started with so it's starting a firmware update the current petition is b and so the update will be applied to a so because we don't want to write to our current petition because that would be catastrophic we want to um, do it to the non-hot petition or the cold petition all of these steps are user configurable so you can adapt this however you want um, we're just doing some sensible defaults that are in this kind of implementation for rugby that in the rug play, we're actually downloading the image directly from the GitHub repository um, that we've made available. So we can actually see uh, see that we're streaming the download. So I'm just using wget, streaming the download, de uh, like decompressing it and directly streaming it to rug play. So rug play is then doing the install via like the standard input piping and then writing directly to the new kind of petition. Once it's done that, it says, OK, I the install worked, but to switch over to the petition. We need to do a restart. This is common for all solutions because you have two petitions. One's a hot, one's a cold. So you need to be able to then actually boot into the new one. So because again, this is also you need a bit of insight into what is happening because you know my device is currently rebooting at the moment. So I, I've also put a message saying, hey, I'm actually rebooting to the spare petition. So I'm going from B to A. So it's super clear what you're transitioning into. So the expectation, um, you, you can kind of guide the user through the process. So if something would happen, like for example, it didn't switch petition for some reason, um, then you know, you can kind of use that in your debugging kind of setup. We can see here that, for example, the the workflows picked up again, going, hey, I've been restarted. Um, it even waits for your network connectivity to be established because without network connectivity, if you don't have real time clock and with a battery in it, then you actually your time gets reset. So usually and until your time is actually in sync, you can't generally connect to things that require certificates because either your certificate is not valid yet because you're back in 1970 and the certificate valid starts from, you know, I don't know, minus a year or something. Um, so it does all of this kind of smart things and waits for the kind of the time to be in sync and then continues on because otherwise then we would also have these events happening in 1970, which no one wants. Um, we can see that it's actually, so it's gone, yep, Reboot worked, network's available. I'm continuing the workflow and I'm currently on petition A. So I can confirm the petition swap has happened. I'm doing the verify because 
we need to then verify that the device is healthy. So we've proven that the petition has booted up okay, so that's a good start. However, usually just checking the petition has booted is not good enough to say, is my IoT device still able to connect to the IoT platform? That's quite critical. So we've added in the check part of the workflow state, so the verify state, to say, I want to check that FinEdge is actually working because maybe in the new image, I've put the wrong um, architecture version. So FinEdge is a dud version that doesn't even uh, run properly. Um, or whatever critical resources you have, you can add your own verified logic in. But we've seen that it's passed. So it says, yep, I'm now happy. So the commit basically says, I've confirmed everything is OK in the new petition. Now I want to make that my default. So that will then remember. So if another reboot happens, it will actually stay in the A petition. Should something catastrophic happen or something, or you reboot before the commit has happened, you will go back to the previous petition because you haven't confirmed that everything's OK. Um, so you'll go back to what was working before. But we can see here that everything's been successful. So my new default petition is now A. And we can see that the operation is successful, fantastic, and I'm now operating on the new version. So that's how it looks for the user. Um, all of the events are optional. This is just what I, I like to see the presence, you know, what's happening under the hood in a kind of a sequential order. So it helps, it makes it easier for me to debug. You do not need to go into a level where you showing the executing the commands. That's probably too technical for people. Um, that was as useful for me. Um, so you can customize all of this because in the end, it's using a thin edge is delivering the ability to execute a workflow. We don't try to dictate what the workflow is. Then. Yeah, and let's just confirm everything's kind of working. Yes, it's all kind of responding. I can do shell commands. And I think I even added a build info file. But I can see that this is the actual build info, which um, gets added at build time just to confirm. Yes, this is my image uh, version, just so we can make sure everything works properly. So we can see that now everything has worked and if I go htop or sorry htop is already installed but I'll get to that shortly okay so now let's just check on our image but I think it's still building yeah it's still building it should only be another like five minutes okay so what's happening under the hood we can maybe look at the, the RugPy image just to kind of demonstrate how this kind of mechanism works. Or what does a workflow look like? So I just want to preface with we're still doing some usability improvements on the exact workflow syntax. So we're still doing changes there. So don't be worried if it looks a little bit complicated. Um, we're still adjusting it to make it a little bit more suitable. But in the end, and what will not change, is that a workflow is just a TOML file. So for example, here it's a firmware update. So detailing that it's related to a firmware update. And I'll just put for RugPy just so I, I know this is a RugPy one because I've created two, one for RugPy, one for Mender. So the contents of the file are fairly simple. So you have your type definition to say, what command or what operation type is this workflow for? So for the firmware update, this is a firmware update because that's the, the magic word that we have for firmware update. Then each of these things that come after, so it will be a configuration section, each of those is a state. So the workflow is actually a state machine. So you go through the different points in the workflow and your workflow basically dictates the current state and where do I go next? So for example, we have some predefined states, for example, that you always have to have an init state. 
um, and a failed and successful. So if we go at the bottom, so that these are the three states that are always needed because you always need to start somewhere and you always need to end. And generally the end is, was I, did I work or did I not work? All of the stuff in between is up for users to kind of define. There might be a few exceptions here. Maybe we do need this or to have to double check the documentation, but there's a, a minimum set of required states that need to be there. All of the rest is kind of up to you. So how do I do, how did I do like the rug pie workflow? So I used the, the basic states to say, hey, let's go init and scheduled. Then with the executing, for each of the states, you can then define what thing should be executed at this state. Because you can define what should be executed at this state, you can execute anything you want. So for me, I prefer writing a POSIX shell script so I can kind of coordinate the, what I need to do within a shell script and I can manage the different states. So you can see all of this script stuff. It's calling the same script, but it's using a different kind of first argument to say, what should I do? So in this, I'm just mirroring basically the state I'm in so that I should be just going to the download. So please do the download now. So the first executing will just go executing and then that just says, yes, go to the download state. So after I've finished executing, whatever I do there, I think I just do a logging. So I just created an event to say, hey, I'm I want to do uh, send a message that I'm starting to do the firmware update and what petition am I on? Once I've done that, I want to do any potential download logic. So I call the download and you can actually pass information from the command. Uh, so from the internal command, so the MQG represent, representation of the command, then to the script executing it. So for instance, to download it, I need a URL, right? So I'm actually passing in. So the Webflow dictates a bit of a template language that you can then specify what you want to download, for example. So the URL, I just created, hey, pass a URL as a flag. And I want the workflow, before I execute the script, evaluate this whole string and replace this template variable with the actual URL. And so then the download can go, ah, okay, that's a real URL. Maybe you want to do a validation of the URL. In this instance, I'm actually transforming the URL. So let's just have a look at the vendor workflow, uh, sorry, the uh, Rugby workflow. And let's just go to download. So the download step, I'm actually doing a few kind of advanced things. So if the URL comes in a specific form, for example, if it's the direct, um, by default, the URL to the binary will actually be the, the raw hate, um, the raw comolosity URL. But maybe because I don't want to worry about credentials in my um, script, I can actually use the local thin edge proxy so the CAY proxy to do the request for me. So to be able to do that, I'm kind of reshaping the URL or formatting it to actually then use the local comolosity proxy. So I'm taking the same base path from the URL, adding it to the local proxy, and then magically I don't need to do any authentic uh, authentication because it's a locally available endpoint on the device, so I can just reuse that. So this unique kind of so at this state, doing the download, you want to kind of enrich the data for the state so it can be more usable in the following state. So in this instance, I actually have, so I do a bit of like URL reformatting. I then even have options. So again, this is just what I, I like to test. How far can we push it? Um, so I even have the the setup where I can say, well, do I want to manually download it or do I want to offload the downloading to the thing that I'm calling? Totally up to you. You can kind of, because different tooling has different requirements. So sometimes you can stream a download, sometimes you can't. So 
but being able to be flexible in the workflow enables you to be more adaptable to different tooling. And you can do different kind of caching mechanisms that you want. You can do a lot of wonderful things. Um, so in this instance, I think, what am I doing? Yeah, I'm not doing a manual download. So all this function is doing, okay, I'm not downloading anything. All I'm going to do is write this TED URL to the workflow state to say, hey, this is the URL property. If we go back to there, just to look at this kind of state transition stuff, in the following, so from the download, we go to the install, because that's what's been dictated by this um, called in the download step. We go to the install, and now this is actually using, it's referring to the state which was published or like enriched in the previous state. So in this one, I've actually converted the remote URL into a quasi local URL, like the real URL that we can actually use in this install step. So you can do this kind of like pass information, the sharing of information between states by just reusing the MQT model. And we have a very simple interface to be able to do this, but this enables you to do really, really wonderful things. Um, so in the install state, it doesn't really care where the URL comes from. It just goes, just give me a URL, I'll use it. So you can kind of break your logic into very well-defined um, little buckets where everything's self-contained and it's a stateless function because it's just taking the input and producing an output. It doesn't need to remember anything because the workflow is doing like the injecting the state for you. So you can continue this whole way through that if you're using the same principles, like if everything is successful, uh, go to the restart state where we can trigger a device restart. Um, after we do a restart, we verify it. And all these things. So all of these states, like the states here are configurable. You can do as many or as little as you want. Um, it really depends on the tooling that you're using to interface with. Some will have different requirements. So I'm hoping, I know there's probably going to be a lot of questions regarding this, and I know it's very, very technical. Um, I think the key point is it's configurable. If you remember that, fantastic. Um, some of the documentation is already available, um, but it's a, we're in the process of changing a bit of the API, so I wouldn't recommend like using um, the API, but I think the concepts are quite clear. Um, so that can be helpful if you just go through kind of what this means, just to kind of get the key points to it. Um, but don't focus too much on the actual kind of implementation um, because we're we're currently making that a little bit more friendly. But if we go back to the my action, just to confirm, okay, so before 15 minutes ago, I triggered a new build because I wanted a, a new package to be included. So part of our example is, so this is real end-to-end -end example. And I just wanted to show kind of what's possible with the different toolings available. So part of the workflow is, because I've tagged it, and generally when you tag something in a Git repository, that means, hey, you're doing a release. So part of the workflow then creates the release for me. It's creating a draft because I want to do a sanity check before I publish this. And we can see here, these are all the images that I've created. So I've created one for Raspberry Pi 0 and 1s, uh, for 0, 2W, and 2 and 3, and the different versions. You even have an SBOM included in that. So you can kind of say, hey, what software is actually installed? And I can see, hey, HTOP is installed. Fantastic. Now I've done my sanity check and go, OK, I'm ready to release it so we can, so people can actually consume it. I'm just going to set it as pre-release because you can choose however you want. It's a GitHub thing. Now, I've just done a pre-release. Also in this repository, it will automatically configure that when I do a release, it will publish the artifacts directly to Comelocity. So it, it creates the firmware repository entries. 
So if we go back to Comelocity and we just look at the firmware repository, and I'll just take this example. Uh, it's already loaded, that was quick. Uh, I think it takes like 20 seconds. Oh yeah, it's already done. So magically, this is the new version that I started during the demo. It just links, so it creates this entity which allay, enables it to be selected within Comelocity. It doesn't upload it to Comelocity, so you're still using efficient resources and going, well, if, if GitHub want to offer these features for free as a, um, a kind of like a, a binary or a blob store, perfect. Uh, we can use those free services. Um, so it just adds a link with the URL where the real image is. And now if I go back to my device that I'm on, magically I'll have a new entry. So I can then perform another update. So the, this just really highlights how you can kind of build in a very modern CI process. So it's really CI CD because you could even put in part deploying the image if you really wanted. Um, but the idea is to have a end-to-end -end flow from building an image to be able to publish and deploy an image or like deploy the actual thing to a device. So that's quite easy. I, I must admit with RugPy, um, with Yocto, you definitely need your own build system because the minimum requirements of Yocto um, are quite high. So you definitely need to um, have your own runner and not use a free hosted runner because you need at least 100 gigabytes free um, and about 12 hour build times. Because with Yocto, you build everything from scratch, Linux kernel, everything. Um, so that is a very, very slow process. Now I'll just quickly show, so that was for RugPy. Um, we want to show the Mender, and this is actually quite a lot quicker. So I have a folder for my Yocto Tedge devices, which is uh, Mender enabled. I can see that I'm running the Kirkstone distribution of Yocto. That's my firmware image, and again, a version. So if I just go to that, so this has a different workflow is using a different update mechanism, but it's all the same principles. So I can actually update, well, I'm actually going to downgrade. So I'm going to go for the current image that we had and then to a previous image here. And because I followed the same kind of flow just for demonstrational purposes, uh, so again, using events to kind of show, hey, what is happening now? And you'll see that the, the messages are very, very similar. Um, with the, the core differences is when you actually apply the install, we're doing a Mender install. And for the Mender, uh, so currently, I think this binary, as you can see here, it's actually hosted in Comelocity uh, because the, the Mender builds, are the Yocto builds are a lot smaller than generally what you get with Raspberry Pis, only because when you're building an image, it's for a specific target. So the target device will be a Raspberry 4 64-bit. That is the only device type that that image is valid for. So you really have to be careful that you don't select the wrong ones. However, there are protection mechanisms because it's a robust update. They can protect against accidentally um, applying the wrong image because you always have the fallback to go to. So if it's not bootable, um, it will fall back automatically. So for the Mender update, um, because the binary is hosted in Comelocity, Mender actually has a, I wouldn't say bug, a limitation that it can't do a ranged, or it fails to stream a download if the content length isn't specified. However, there's a wrong implementation from the Mender side that they don't request a byte range, which means that they actually balk downloading directly uh, from the, the Bob store. So because of that restriction with the Mender, it, Mender client, in the workflow, I was able to compensate for that problem. So for that, I download the binary manually because I go, ah, okay, this is from a uh, Comlocity URL, which isn't 
compatible or with Mender isn't compatible with it. Um, so I'll manually download it and then I'll do the Mender install from the locally downloaded file. Exactly like with the RugPy that we need a restart. So we're restarting the device at the moment. So it's currently then switching partition. You can see, hey, it's already come up. It's done the commit. So I'm now, so I started on the B partition and I'm now on the A partition. And that includes then the new version. So my firmware is then I've downgraded to yesterday's version. So again, same kind of user experience, but the the implementation is slightly different. Um, so but what we want to show is that it's very compatible with different kinds of solutions, which is very important for thin edge because exactly like we want to be, let's say cloud agnostic, we also don't want to lock into specific technologies as that generally changes over time. So, you know, Mender standalone is quite prevalent, um, but then maybe for Raspberry Pis with the newer fit, maybe RugPi is a better kind of fit there. Um, there's not going to be one solution that's okay for everyone. So we wanted to just show that we're adaptable to different kinds of solutions out there. So for the Yocto stuff, um, we do it, it because it's a very complicated uh, tool. Um, we've tried to find a few other toolings around it to make life a little bit easier. Um, so we have like a meta Tech project where it looks at trying to simplify as much as possible um, the Yocto complexity. Um, so with the help of the CAS project, which is fantastic Siemens tool um, to yeah, simplify the whole thing. So in the end that you can build a different um, like a, a demo project which has thin edge with the Mender standalone client and that you can even publish your artifacts to Comlocity if you're using Go CAY CLI and so to make it as seamless as possible. But unfortunately we can't run this on a GitHub hosted CI runner due to Mender's crazy requirements that you need to have 100 gigabytes where I would actually remember, recommend 500 um, and it's it's very finicky with and what systems it runs. Um, yeah, so we're looking to add this documentation to the website so we can have a bit more of an in-depth tutorial style kind of documentation to say this is if you've never used Yocto, this is how you kind of use it in the context of thin edge. Um, and you know we'll demonstrate what the general project flow is again with the flashing the boot image, the onboarding the device edit your image, build your image, deploy, and that cycle there. Um, because we realize there's a lot of users who might not be familiar with Yocto. However, a lot of the device manufacturers like the smart equipment makers, I think are already using Yocto. Um, so we also have a more power user section um, to show you know, what layer you use and all this kind of stuff. OK, I know there's a lot of content, um, so now I guess I'll open up the the mics for questions. I'm assuming people can unmute themselves, um, but type in the chat Ruben, if you can't. Ruben, you have some questions in the chat. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I'm on a single monitor, so it's a little bit uh, hard to check. So I, I'll just read them out in case people uh, kind of. So from Eric, hi Eric, is there some checking done if the install was okay before rebooting? Um, it depends on the technology. So most upgrade technologies, the validation of the image is usually involved in the install step. So for example, if you give it a dud blob to RugPy, it will say, hey, this is you know, it doesn't include petition map or, or whatever it needs. Um, so it will actually fail in that step. And because it's only overriding the spare petition, even if it would to, let's say if that check didn't happen for whatever reason, um, and it just blindly wrote blob like bytes to the, um, the non-hot petition, the bootloader will switch because it tries to boot up into the new one, but it doesn't save that setting. And if 
it doesn't boot, then it switches back. So it kind of there's some protection from the bootloader as well if whatever checks uh, sanity checks aren't done. Um, but most tools like Mender do this. Um, so you can even, I think, sign your uh, releases with Mender um, to validate. Is it coming from a trusted source? I think SW Update have also a signature kind of uh, mechanism available. Um, so that makes it all kind of. Yeah, so it's usually ingrained in the tools. Um, then follow up question, what part of this magic is part of TE and what is part of the dual boot firmware magic tools like Mender and RockPy? Yeah, so ThinEdge is executing a workflow. We don't care what that workflow is. It could be installing software, to be honest. We don't care. We're just executing different commands. Um, so we don't really, it could be related to a firmware update. It could not be because generally the traits of a AB update is really dependent on the software you or like the technology you're using. So if you had something proprietary, then it slots very nicely into ThinEdge because you can define your custom steps. If that's calling, you know, custom API calls or something, you don't even need to do a reboot. That's okay. Just don't say you need to do a reboot and then you're good. So it's it's very, very flexible. And in the end, this workflow concept, this will be the basis for all commands. So you can do very complex kind of um, uh, detailed kind of sequences of events via workflow to do custom logic. Yeah, it's it's more of a question when we will make that available for everyone to use for anything. Um, but for the firmware, it will definitely be confirmed for the firmware uh, for this year. Uh, that customization of that will be possible and we'll have the details on that, um, how that's possible. We might even package up the Mender and RugPy into individual packages that you can just install, you know, the workflow and maybe the associated script possibly uh, to make it a little bit more consumable uh, and easier to kind of track that that is only like the workflow stuff. Um, but yeah, FinEdge doesn't do any of the uh, atomic steps itself in terms of like the preparation and stuff like that. It just makes sure that these steps get executed. And the reason for that is there's a lot of trusted tooling out there already which does this. Most of the trusted tooling out there, however, doesn't have a free over-the-air update mechanism that you can do it from the cloud. Most solutions will, will get you to pay for that. Whereas we're trying to break that mold and going, well, let's take the trust of these tools which can do the reliable AB updates Let's reuse them, but make it into a free cloud interface. So again, but not because if we did it ourselves, then we'd be incompatible. If someone is already using Mender I/O, then we're going well. Why do we, you know, if you have to install ThinEdge and ThinEdge then has to um, do its own kind of um, AB update mechanism, then the two systems would inherently be incompatible with each other. So we want to slot in nicely with everyone and also use trusted tools and open source tools. Um, so SW Update is, I think, quite popular in terms of open source, but there's also a few other like more commercially. I think Soda is one, um, which is very big in Yocto, I believe. Um, but again, most of them are usually connected to some kind of paying service. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I know probably for the power users who people who want to build images and especially like Yocto images. Um, next year, we're also looking to have a few more like hands on technical sessions to kind of ease this process to basically learn from our learnings because there are quite a lot because it's a very complicated tool, uh, Yocto. Um, so we're planning to have a few sessions next year to kind of help people if you're not familiar with a few of the more advanced Linux tooling. Um, how to use that just to kind of yeah help you guys out. Um, but we'll schedule those me um those sessions next year sometime. 
then actually if because it's being recorded, I'm going to attempt a live thing as a kind of add on bonus. If you don't have time, that's OK. Um, thanks for joining. Um, but another kind of additional tooling is I'm just going to show a little bit of a live onboarding kind of exercise, how we can kind of simplify the process a little bit. So I'm going to take my newly flashed Raspberry Pi 2 um, and just boot it up live and to show kind of how some additional tooling could look like. Um, because I've had to do a lot of this recently because I've flashed about a million SD cards over the last two weeks. Um, so I just, and I've created some additional things that potential for Commonwealth users, especially Go see it, YCLI users, uh, it might be a good Christmas present. Uh, so let me just find my power cord. So this is a newly connected device. So it has a fresh, this is like the bootable image, like the bootstrapping image. So it doesn't know anything about um, Commolosity at this point in time. So let me just share my screen. So it should be booting. I'm just, yep, I can see some lights flashing. Um, so let's assume I want to onboard my device to Commolosity. But I'm still in a dev, so I'm still happy using self-signed certificates. So I've actually created a, a Tedge Go See It Why plugin or extension. So it's a CLI tool for interacting with Commolosity. Um, but I've just created a few things, A, to make my life easier, but it might make other people's lives easier. So part of these kind of demo images, we've also tried to make them a little bit more usable. So part of the usability is when you connect a new device, the question is, what host name does it get? How do I make that unique if I have more than one device? Because just calling it Raspberry is, is not great. How do I do that based on maybe hardware? Um, so the hardware is unique. So if I flash different images, it always has the same identity. Um, so on the same device, if I just use two different I know, SD cards and switch in between the two. So we've actually enabled self-discovery mechanisms within the base image. So it's not directly with ThinEdge itself, but using stuff like Avahi, um, we've actually created um, Avahi service. And if you can see this, so I, in part of my custom Go CAY CLI extension, so the Tedge extension, um, I've created a scan which does a local network scan using the um, DNS SD discovery mechanism. So here I've done a scan and my Raspberry Pi 2 hasn't come up because it's still booting. It still has to do the initialization things. I did another scan and it's now said, hey, I'm on the network. It has a unique name. Now I want to onboard this device because it doesn't have any certificates at this point in time, doesn't know what Comlocity instance I'm talking to. So I just want to show that I'm not kind of, um, you know, faking any of this. So that this is the instance I'm searching for it, but it's not there. So I want to then bring it into Convolosity. So we also have a bootstrap. So I now want to bootstrap this device. So I'm giving it, I'm going to be doing the bootstrapping via SSH, but this is all abstracted in the bootstrap command, which is part of the Go CAY CLI extension that I created. So here, all I have to do is bootstrap, then say, what device do I want to bootstrap? There is actually a, um, a scan functionality that I could do this automatically, um, but I'll just do this explicitly. Um, so the bootstrap, I want to say, because I know the images that I've built, have the root user and I already have built my public certificate. So my public SSH key inside the certificate so I can access it um, or like with your bootstrap SSH user. And I just that's the address because this is the local address. I just want to force that it's local communication. I do this. It goes, hey, cool. I found it because it's a new device. SSH is asking for my key. Yep. Like say this fingerprint is OK. Looks OK to me. And so. It's saying, oh, OK, it's detected. Yes, this will be the common name of the certificate. Do I want to upload that to Comolosity? 
So I've already set my session for com like using the go CYCLI. I'll just go yes. Ooh. Obviously not because my session has expired. Let me do that again. Let's bootstrap it again. So if it's sounds of bootstrapping, you know, it won't really do anything. OK, my session is not expired anymore. So it uploads. Using your current session, because in my current context of GoCYCLI, it knows already what Comlocity instance I want to talk to, what my credentials are for my user, and it doesn't need to put any of that info on the device whatsoever in terms of, you know, I don't need to upload or put my Comlocity username there. So it uses the URL and does the, you know, the tedge config set CAY URL command and passes, but it's a seamless experience. And lo and behold, part of the, because I like creating a rich kind of user experience, it brings up my device automatically once it's bootstrapped. So this is my new device that I just onboarded with one command or two, because I had to discover. So because this is really, this is not really like thin edge tooling, but what I wanted to kind of highlight is thin edge tooling enables us to do other cool things like, you know, interacting and playing nicely with other stuff like Go CAY CLI. Um, so it makes the onboarding experience a little bit easier and cleaner um, that I can do all these things automatically. So I, I saw there was a question. Right, any questions like that? So that was just the kind of sneak peek with some. So actually that extension is available already if you are a keen subscriber to my uh, GitHub repository. Um, you just made somewhere. my life much easier. Yeah, so, so there are like, um, so there's a few kind of, um, you know, clean up points, but what I just want to kind of communicate is if there's additional kind of day-to-day -day commands which would be useful from users that are maybe in the Comlocity context, like a deprecation of services and we need to delete the services, then that would probably be a good extension point to add into here. And for instance, I also created a, I don't know, because debug show like a command to debug information, which then gathers information about the device to say, hey, create a ticket and come in, in GitHub. And if we copy, you know, that information, I can replace all that because I hate filling that out because it's annoying. Um, and then you have rich information that you can copy paste, for example. So you can kind of do these kind of nice dev like activities. Um, yeah, quite easy. Boom, how actually is the scan working that you only see the res Raspberry Pi there? Do you yeah, filter? so th that's basically an Avahi uh, filter. Um, so it's an Avahi service definition. So for example, part of the, uh, sorry, I'm just finding the right image. I have a million things open. So part of, the so I, I I've done this both or we've done this both for the Raspberry Pi uh, so the Rug Pi and the uh, Thin Edge layer in Yocto. So if we just look at Thin Edge and files, now I forgot where I put it. Oh yeah, bootstrapping. So there's so I now I can't remember where I put all this stuff. There will be a file called Avahi somewhere. Yeah, there's basically a service definition file, which you discover. Um, uh, P scan. Oh. Yeah, it's a Avahi service discovery, so Avahi. So it's a, a very Linux, it's kind of like, yeah, the bonjour or zero conf kind of uh, setup. 
So there's a specific kind of um, URL, uh, sorry, like um, service type definition that we define then for ThinEdge to say, hey, I am ThinEdge uh, to make that easier. But do you, you don't have to configure anything on the Raspberry Pi as you stated, it's a, it's a blank it image. Is. Yeah, so it's part of the image, yes. So for example, that's the service discovery service type. So as part of the image, I've just included that to make the image a little bit more usable um, to say I am ThinEdge and that's a unique kind of identifier. Because if I didn't have that service type discovery, I would see all of my home automation stuff in there. I would see yeah, yeah, exactly. you know, laptops and all asking. that stuff. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, so it's, yeah, so that works quite nicely and makes it a little bit more auto discovery. And because the the host name is then, you know, can be interpreted from the the output of your scan. Yeah, so it's using like, again, open source tooling, like normal Linux tooling, but showing just that kind of rich user experience then that you can going, well, actually maybe I could automate my onboarding if I'm happy doing SSH kind of things, or you could do your own, CA signing from your dev computer that you're happy to sign the device certificates. So not using the self sign, but do your own kind of uh, local CA. That's also kind of possible. And because in the Go CAY CLI, you're already in the commonality context, a lot of barriers kind of fall away because you don't need to enter the URL because you're already in the context. You don't need to enter your username, you're in the context. So that makes it very, very um, a nice user experience. Okay, um, if there's no questions, thanks for staying for the extra kind of sneak peek, um, additional tooling. Happy to have also uh, extra contributions uh, to any of the tooling, whether it's the layers and stuff, but we'll look to have all of the links there and uh, tutorials and demos uh, on the website. Well, cool, then thanks for joining and see you next time.